Greetings, adventure. Welcome to the D20 Academy podcast. I'm Shiloh. And I'm Gabriel. And this week is World Building Settlements, Part 2. Hey, you guys. Welcome back to our World Building series. This time we are tackling Part 2 of Settlements. Last time, in Part 1, we talked about leadership, law, human rights, transportation. This time, we're going to be talking about trade, commerce, business, and military. Yep. Hey, guys, if you want to check out uh, what we're doing here, if you want to keep up to date with, with what we're doing here on the podcast, we have an actual play series. We, we got some cool stuff going on. You can follow us on Instagram at D20 underscore Academy, and you can join the community in our Discord if you just DM us on Instagram or comment or whatever. We'll get you into our Discord. Really cool, a lot of fun. We do homebrew spotlights. We have lots of cool discussions. Uh, and also, you can find all of the podcast episodes on YouTube as well, uh, just D20 Academy on YouTube. Welcome back. Hey. To episode 55, Road Building, Settlements, Part 2, Legos. Legos. Mm Mm-hmm. So now we've taught you how to build your world, your settlements. (laughs) Now here's how to do all of that, but with Legos. Yeah. All right. So choose your favorite Lego set. (laughs) Actually, choose a couple. It's best to mix and match, you know? You know, take some things that are already created and formed and then make it your own, you know? Hey, you know, fun fact. Uh, the other day, I just found out, I just realized, I'll say, um, that if it is an original Lego setting, like Ninja thing or... Ninjago? Ninjago or whatever. If it's an original Lego world, people... Lego have, City? <laughs> Yeah, everybody has yellow skin. But if it's based off of something else, like Star Wars or Indiana Jones or whatever, they have the skin color of that character. Did that just blow your mind? All right. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. I was like, Mm -hmm. whoa. I wondered why some people, some Lego characters have, you know, bright yellow skin, but then others will have, like, the skin color of the corresponding character. But now I see. Now I understand. Anyway. uh, (laughs) Hey, guys. This is world building, where we talk about world building. Yes, it is. And not about Legos, if, you know, surprisingly. You know, that might be like a spinoff that comes somewhere down the line, you know? Yeah. The the Lego podcast. I guarantee you there are. Uh, they have to exist out there. They're probably. There's podcasts for everything. All right. Okay, trade and commerce. Trade. Mm-hmm. That's our first little subtopic here. <laughs> Not little, actually. This is a big, this is a big, big subtopic. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All right, trade and commerce is an important part of any settlement. Trade and commerce, you know, facilitates essentially living. Some settlements live primarily off of trading. Some of them, you know, trade what they make. Some of them import all the things that they eat, that they wear, that they use. You know, that's great, you know? Trade and commerce is a big part of any settlement, as I said earlier. Trade and... You want to figure out how that works in your settlement. Yeah, trade works. Uh, wh- when trade is unlocked, it allows for. It's just civilization. Like what? What? How do you... Yeah, it allows for settlements to exist in places where they normally couldn't exist. Mm, mm-hmm. Um, like Gabe was just saying, if there's a place where it's very hard to get food, if you can't find a way to trade there's no roads you can't have a town there because everyone's gonna starve but if you can just import your food you can have a town there uh and actually trading commerce is what connects settlements to other settlements (laughs) primarily (laughs) primarily that's what it is you do you do want to think about uh commerce within your own within that particular settlement right how it works in it within it but also how it works in the bigger scheme of things in world economics as well. Yeah. 
again, this might not be necessarily something that is super important in, in like, your story, but it does help to understand, like, how a civilization exists in this area, you know? Yeah. If you detail, if, okay, it's just, it's just to maintain, like, the inner logic, you know? The eternal logic of the story, is that there's this mountainous town and really barren landscape, how does it survive? Yeah. If not for trade. Exactly. Um, so let's look at this first few questions here. How is trade facilitated? Is it carried out by traveling merchants? By a guild? Are there auctions? Um, is it free market? Um, is it run by the government? Um, yeah. One of the worlds... Uh, not one of the worlds. One of the settlements that I have in my fantasy world that we played our first campaign in long ago... Um, actually, they never visited it in their campaign, but that's beside the <laughs> point. One of the t one of the settlements there, the government runs trade, so they buy product off of the citizens and sell it to traders and people who come through. So, like the government is actually like the main source of them. They're like the they they control the trade and all that kind of stuff, um, and they like take their taxes from what they collect. Um, yeah. This can also be like affected by what type of government system you have. Yeah, like you talked about like a socialist government one. where the government isn't is responsible for maintaining and providing for all of the citizens. Then they may the government themselves might be the ones who are negotiating the trade deals with other settlements to feed the entire settlement. Yeah, or to clothe the settlement, or to this or that. Yeah. Exactly, All but right. yeah, just just want to figure out like, how does it work? <laughs> um, okay, next for next one. What cities, countries, or regions are allies, trade partners, and how has this changed throughout history? This connects to like a lot of the other topics that we've talked about, like the one about history, and the other settlements one, um, and just like culture as well. Um, you know, just how different settlements, cities, you know, regions, kingdoms, whatever it is. How, how, what is their relationship, at least, you know, economically with other places, right? Do they have nice roads that they're always trading on? Do they, you know, hold back trading if they're trying to get something from someone else or whatever? And yes. how has their economic relationship changed throughout history? This is an important thing to keep in mind when you're forming relationships between settlements and kingdoms in different parts of the world. Like, how yeah. trade routes form and how trade agreements form is something that happens over time, you know? That takes into account the economic impacts, the impact in their, like, relationship between the two settlements or whatever. There's a lot of things to take into account when figuring out trade packs and how the cities and countries and regions inter interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And trade is an important part of that. You can uh, see this in our own history, how yeah. sometimes trade packs are are formed out of necessity, you know? You yeah. might not necessarily get along with each other, but you have this that I need, and I have this that you need. Yeah. Or, sometimes it's to show, uh, like, um, like, just show, like, of appreciation, or, or a show of, you know, trust in each other to form this so that they can form a, a longer lasting, more impactful relationship between the two settlements or cities or countries or whatever. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons that trade packs are formed and a lot of things to factor into them. Yeah. Now, the importance of this in your world is trade packs can be an important thing that can help show your players, show your readers like how the nations and settlements interact with each other and their positions on each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots based on their economic um, relationship, and I'm about to say, as I always say, but I've never, I never say this. Um, but <laughs> what and what I believe is that where there is a relationship, there's a story, and I think that I don't, you know, any kind of relationship, if it's a, a friendship, it's if it's romantic, if it's a, a, a rivalry, um, if there, where there's a relationship, there's a story, and I think you can definitely make stories. Um, or if you're playing tabletop RPG adventures or whatever, 
definitely off of this concept of allies and enemies and you know being able to trade you know the if they're trade partners or how they interact even just economically like not even like militarily um like if one of them is like trying to invade the other or, or whatever or one of them has promised aid to the other militarily but just like even just like economically like how they interact and if there's like a standstill and all that kind of stuff that's relationship right between two two cities or, or two you know regions or whatever um and i think you can totally come up you know make stories out of that um you know are they do they have to create a road and a new path to to connect to trade um but like neither of them wants to do that they both want to uh want the other person to uh do more on that road or whatever it is right like you can totally come up with any kinds of stories and adventures um based off of a relationship between like two nations not just like two people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or like multiple nations right you know, yeah are, are there could be multiple yeah. nation trade packs we see that in our own world yeah our two speaking violent. of which so oh, good is there some sort of like universal currency in your world that the nations trade with yeah is it primarily like oh i give you this good and you give me this you know gold this whatever sort of currency or is it purely i give you this product and you give me that product yeah currency is uh, you don't have to go too deep into it because it can get it can get crazy um and definitely like if you have like an interactable world like one meant for a tabletop rpg uh going detailed into currency is just gonna make things confusing um but if you're like a writer and you're creating a story or something like that, uh, yeah, you could you can go ham on your currency. Um, I love <laughs> coins. I love. I, I you love electron pieces. Yeah, like electron pieces. Um, <laughs> I'm just really fascinated with coins. I don't know. That's it's kind of weird, but I collect coins from the different places them, that I go to. Um, like I love Japanese coins. They have like holes in the middle, and like Icelandic <laughs> coins are really cool looking. Anyway, it doesn't matter, but. Yes, universal currency. Um, I mean, one thing that I think you can do that's not too complex, but, like, have a universal currency in, like, gold and silver and, and copper or whatever. But, like, the symbols that is that they are minted with or whatever can say something about the coinage, right? Even, even a, a, gold, a gold piece coin, uh, you know, minted in this city and one minted in this city have this can have the same value in your world. But what is it like imprinted on that coin, all that kind of stuff can you can like use that like in an interesting way, right? Like if there's two cities and the rivals and someone goes to one of those cities and starts paying with coins from the other city like minted in that, are people going to be like irritated about that? Are they going to, you know what I mean? So I think that's something cool. You, that's not like too complex because you're not changing like the conversion rate or anything. Um, mm -hmm. but that's something to think about too. Yeah. All right. Are there banks in your world? Do settlements have banks or other some sort of financial institution that people go to and exchange money with or invest money in or store money in or how do people keep all their money? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of like a, again. A, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. This is like, Deeper. it's not a super big thing. Yeah. Getting into the extreme details of economics isn't exactly important for every story. Yeah, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> In fact, it's not really important for many stories. Yeah. So, I think a more practical thought with this question would be, how do people, in on an individual basis, like how do people store their money? Is it normal for people to have their money entirely in like their livestock? And their goods that they have that they own, or do they have chests that they keep in there? Yeah, no, yeah, no, it is actually important. And definitely, if you're playing a tabletop role-playing game, when you have no idea what your players are gonna do, um, if you haven't figured that out, then you can be you kind of have to make a lot a lot of stuff on the spot sometimes. Um, you know, if someone's like, "I want to pick a pocket," you're like, "Wait, do they have all their money in their pockets?" <laughs> <laughs> or they're like, "I want to break into their house." Or do they have do their, they money, keep their in money in there or they're like we want to heist this bank and you're like oh yeah wait are there banks in my city um but that's that's genuinely something to think about once again you can totally make adventures out of this breaking into someone's house 
stealing their money, replacing it with fake money or whatever it is, obviously heisting a bank, classic, make an adventure out of that very easily. Um, <laughs> money, people just, excuse me, people want money and people want to protect their money. Uh, oh, like maybe mm. it's magical, right? Maybe someone puts it into like a, a side demi plane that only they can access or whatever. Like that's cool and interesting. Um, yeah, just something to think about. But yeah, it's not too important to think about yeah. banking and financial institutions. <laughs> that's not fun. <laughs> All right. I think that is a bit more pertinent to building a settlement is what are the major exports and imports of that city or region? This factors into a lot of things factored into this, sorry. Yeah. Like geographically, like where are they located? What do they have? What natural resources are around them? What skills do the people in that city have? Are they renowned for their masonry? Are they renowned for their blacksmithery? I don't know if that's, that's not a word. Blacksmithing? It's blacksmithing. Or smithing. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll say that that's all words. <laughs> but keeping in mind a city's major exports or imports can tie heavily into the identity of that yeah. settlement. Yes. It's having a settlement that has a strong identity in their in their blacksmithing. <laughs> yeah. They're renowned worldwide for their weapons, their armor, their this, their that, that they make and create in, in that city. That can tie heavily into the identity. Yes. Um, I, this is really important. The other stuff that we talked about, not too important. Banking and currency denominations and such but i would suggest in making a settlement one of the most important things other than like geographical um location and population and leadership um would be exports and import imports i would say you want to get that down pretty quickly that's one of the main main defining factors of, of a settlement in my opinion whether it's a farming settlement and they export lots of wool or meat or livestock or vegetables. Um, uh, if, if they have to import um, clothing or jewelry or food even, um, it, that's just, I, I think it's very important. And like Gabe was saying, it definitely contributes, contributes to that settlement's identity and kind of like that settlement's like theme, I guess. Um, yeah. Really, and giving really. a settlement that sort of theme, however you do it, if you do it through any other reason that we have described earlier, or described throughout this episode, or if you do it through what they export or import, having a strong theme and identity is really important to making a settlement memorable. Yeah, for sure. And you and you want your settlements to be memorable. I don't like if you're playing a tabletop role playing game, you want your players to be able to remember it. And even if you're just creating any kind of story, you want your audience. To be able to, like, remember it, because even if they don't remember the, you know, fantasy name, but, like, that's that's the city with the... that make the skyships. That's mm -hmm. the city yeah. that makes lots of uh, carrots and onions, you know, the, the farmer dudes. Like, I think coming up with the exports and imports of the city... Exports primarily are, are really important. Um, yeah, like, just really help just solidify it, make it different, make it unique make it interesting. Um, and if, once again, you can come up with lots of different adventures and story hooks based on the exports, right? Like, what if yeah. their primary export was then cut off to them? That's major, right? If it's a, if it's a coastal village that relies on fishing, right, they export lots of fish to get the stuff that they need to survive... And then all of a sudden the fish begin dwindling and disappearing from the ocean. That's putting this settlement in jeopardy. You know, that's very dangerous for the, for the mm -hmm. settlement. And like, okay, or so perhaps there's yeah. danger on the road as they're exporting or importing and they need people to, you know, guard the shipments. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it, it's pretty important. And once again, it, it just adds to the identity, makes it more memorable, makes it uh, unique and interesting um yeah for sure very 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 important mm -hmm. all right so just briefly recap this section here in trade and commerce 
Not all of it is super important for every single story you're going to be telling, but a lot of these things we talked about, especially exports and imports, how trade works, what resources that they have, currency, banks, all of these things can tie into the identity of a region, of a settlement, and can help bring your players and your readers into that world more. Yep. Amen. <laughs> yep. Yep. All righty, Bill. Next I... on. Halsey. <laughs> I agree. Halsey? <laughs> I agree. All right, moving on. Business. Business. Let's get down to business. Business. To defeat. <clears throat> what crafts or trades are highly <laughs> valued in your world or in mm. your settlement on a smaller scale? Yeah. This is a pretty cool thing that you can use to make unique worlds, settlements, and relationships between settlements and individually people is having create crafts or trades be especially valued or looked down upon or looked up upon in your yeah. world and in your settlement so you can help establish relationships on a smaller and a larger scale. Right. And like going back to that export thing, like, People who help out with whatever that export is or whatever, like, that's that's valuable. You want lots of those. If it's a farming village who relies on exporting, you know, vegetables and meat and all that kind of stuff, then farmers are, are valued members of the community because they contribute to the economy of that settlement. Yep. In the same way, in that same farming village... Someone with expertise like that is not commonly found in that village, so like a surgeon or whatever, is also highly valued because there's not a lot of surgeons in the area, mm -hmm. you know? But in, in the surgeon town, where their main export is surgeons, then being a surgeon... The surgeon town? <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, the surgeon town. Where their main export is called a college. Where their main exports are surgeons. A surgeon <laughs> isn't as a, like one surgeon being there or not being there doesn't matter as much as it does in an area where there's not a lot of surgeons. That's actually kind of a cool idea for like a like a town or a city that just trains people to be like doctors just and such. surgeons though. Just surgeons. Only surgeons. <laughs> you go there, and you get so much healing, it's, like, insane. You get so healed. Um, yeah, or just therapists. That's the that's the city that's my favorite. <laughs> uh, yeah, that'd be kind of cool, though. Like, a, an entire city that the people from around, like, the nation, around the world send people to be students there. You know? Right, yeah. Yeah, like, like apprenticeships. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so in this little farming village, they're like, hey, we need a surgeon. So one of the boys, they're like, go send him to the surgeon town. And then <laughs> six years later, he comes back <laughs> with a degree, you know, and then he's, he's the town surgeon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> surgeon town is the next, um, my next, like, rock band. Sturgeon to Yeah, not that I've ever had right. that before. This whole time, every time you said surgeon, I've always thought of, I thought sturgeon. Like, I know you're saying sturgeon. Yeah. But sturgeon, yeah, like the fish. Yeah, me too. I'm just imagining, thinking. like, this whole <laughs> maybe city their main export, sturgeons. Maybe their main export is sturgeons, you know? Surgeon sturgeons. Mm. Okay, hey, tied into what we were just talking about, how do people advance in their fields are their apprenticeships, and how easy is social... Mobility. Yeah. This is how like into like, oh, do people like send people off to be apprenticeships? Are there apprenticeships available in that town, in that city that people go to for this craft, this trade? And does advancing in that craft, that trade, grant you some sort of you know upward social mobility yeah. that you can work in? You know, so if in like for instance, you're in a city is renowned for their craftsmanship and their blacksmithing. And you became 
an apprenticeship. Look, okay, you're, you're no one at first. You're just a normal person in that town. Then you get better, you get better, you get better. Perhaps you get, like, the best in your craft and your trade in that place. That grants you social mobility. Like, being able to advance and people notice that as you advance in your craft and your trade can grant people social mobility. Yeah. Also, a note on advancing in your field. In the... Let's keep going back to our really great example. <laughs> in our farming village, if there's a, a, a doctor there who you know, has basic doctor training and they have a couple books on being a doctor and medicine. If you apprenticeship, apprenticeship, if you apprentice under that doctor, you will only be able to be as good as the resources and the teaching that you have, just that doctor and their various textbooks. So the best doctor in that village may, may be a so-and-so average doctor in Surgeon Town, where they have the resources and the teaching to advance even further. Does that make sense? So, like, you can only advance so far in a certain settlement as that settlement allows, right? Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. the resources mm -hmm. and stuff that they have available. Yeah, okay. Take, for instance, this example with the surgeon in that farming town. Perhaps... They realize that they can only go so far, they can only learn so much with what they have, so that they need to go somewhere else where they can learn more. Exactly. You know? Now, yeah. is this super important? It can be. You can form stories around this. Yeah, you for sure. You form stories where players or characters in your writing and your games need to go and do this so they can advance as a person or advance in their story. You can have the party or the characters accompany someone who's going along this journey. There's a lot of things you can use these ideas for, but it, it just makes sense to, like, think it out, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, what All is right. the normal work schedule for the average person, and what is the average income? Mm. Is there a UBI, you know? <laughs> Yeah, um, average <laughs> income and average, like, if you want to figure out like, the average, like, economic standing of a person in the settlement, you know, yeah. are a lot of people impoverished, are there people who are, you know, head and shoulders above everyone else economically, is everyone on some sort of equal-ish level? This can tie into a lot of things, and it's important to detail. Yeah. Like, how much, not only how much hours do they work, but how much do they make for those hours, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, I think that's really important. And that's something that, like, doesn't explicitly need to be, like, told or whatever, but can be definitely be, like, shown. Yeah. As your character. It's one of those things that can be felt. Like, if they walk into a city, that yeah. and they can just see that people are living, you know, in squalor they get an idea they don't necessarily need to be told yeah. and, and oh you yeah. make this many gold pieces per day and everybody's out working the farms even when they arrive at nighttime right they're yeah poor, exactly but they're still working that is right there right that gives you everything you need to know about like how the economy is in that settlement and it's probably rough for like everybody um because they work a lot but don't make a lot or you know alternatively uh, you know, on the side of the spectrum, everyone's chilling. Like, no one ever is exhausted or anything because they only work a couple hours, but they all live in mansions, right? Like, yeah. And getting this something. idea down of how, like, how well off people are in that city on average ties into a lot of things. Not just how much money they have, but also how they greet outsiders, how they greet people of differing economic levels, how they spend their free time, if they have free time, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Levels of education. That. There's a lot of things that tie into the economic yeah. standing of the average person in a settlement. Yeah. 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 Also, like, kids will probably have to start working at a younger age so that the family can make ends meet and stuff in, like, a more poor settlement or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um compared to kids can grow up 
get their education, go off, get an apprenticeship, see the world, because they, they because their families well off enough that they, you know what I mean. It, it really affects mm -hmm. um, all that kind of stuff, and and you know your your the privilege you grew up with as as a kid or or whatever it is. Yes, and again, this is part of the identity of your settlement, yeah. and this is a really big part. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, taxes. We all love taxes, guys. Don't who we? doesn't love taxes? Everyone loves talking about taxes. I sh I sure love taxes. Gabe, what about you? Mm hmm. It's my favorite thing. Yeah. Um, right after going to the DMV, actually, it's second second favorite. Wow. I'm gonna say I'm gonna put taxes just 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 above just above going to the dmv i think but um mm. but i love that's both. fair it's close race i love both <clears throat> so yeah taxes probably exist in your world because it's a pretty universal thing <laughs> um because you know what what's the saying it's like humans are flawed and death and taxes <laughs> yeah and humans have been flawed since the beginning, and that's why taxes have always existed. And unless there's no sin in your world, there's taxes <laughs> in your world, okay? Because I don't care if it's, if it's called flippin' Alexandrian, you know, I don't, I don't care what the world is called. I don't care if it's a group of planets and you travel in spaceships, there's taxes. Okay? If there's human beings, there's taxes. Even if there aren't human beings. If there are beings. If there are any taxes. beings. Taxes. Mm -hmm. Yes. How right. does tax... What is the system of taxation? <laughs> we, get, we get... We get... Okay. You guys might have guessed by now, but I think taxes exist. <clears throat> Sorry, I get a little worked out there. Mm -hmm. Taxes. He loves them. All right. So, how does, how does taxation work in your yeah. settlement? Is it, I pay this much extra when I buy certain goods, and that goes to paying the tax to the government? Is it, oh, I have to give the government X percent of my yield that year? Yeah. Is it in some sort of currency? Is it in some sort of good? Some sort of export that the people can create that they give to the government? But there's going to be something. There's going to be something. Um, and, and once again, a lot of these are like deeper th world building things, right? Like you don't necessarily have to figure out the t way tax taxes work in every single settlement in your world um, if it's not really important. However, yeah. even though there are these like deeper things that you don't super need to figure out, by delving into them, you can come up with some really cool, interesting things. Like as Gabe was just talking about taxes there, one idea that popped into my head was... What if the way taxes work in this settlement is not money or whatever, it's children. So that you was have exactly to, my idea. You have to tax up a child to the government, whether for experimentation or for the military or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's how you pay your taxes. Um, Don't you love how cool both of our minds are? <laughs> yeah. Our minds immediately go to, ooh, child soldiers and experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> but that is taking something commonplace you know and quote unquote boring as taxes and may you can make make a whole settlement out of that concept and that's like yeah. a gazillion adventures right there um by delving a little deeper and thinking a little harder about this certain aspect of your world bada bing bada boom Is speaking of child soldiers yeah hey good segue let's talk about military Let's delve into the military. Mm-hmm. We, we've talked a little bit All of, right. Of, First off, we're going to be talking about the U.S.'s invasion of other countries and the politics of military. Mm -hmm. Yep. We love Continue. talking about politics here on D20 Academy. Mm -hmm. um, no. Uh, <laughs> we have talked about military a little bit over this world-building series. It, tie, it tied in a little bit to what we were talking about last a world building with like with the government works and how they enforce their rule and stuff um and also and, into history yeah in war and stuff but i want i want you to this is more like specific to your settlement the, the military in regards to your 
settlement. Okay, so starting off, what are your defenses? Is there a wall? Is there a gate? Are there soldiers? Do they have wet, like, uh, what are they called? You know. What is that word, Gabe? Ballistas Weapons? and catapults. And things. Yeah? What are they called? Se uh, Siege weapons. Siege weapons and, like, battlements and... Yeah, yeah, those things. Do you have... Do they have some <laughs> sort of, like, you know, contraptions to also protect, Ooh, like, ballistics, catapults, and sticky tar that they pour down? Um, <laughs> uh, actually, I think... Oh, you're really struggling with this defenses thing. Okay, guys... Defenses. What are the defenses of yourself at? This is really important. <laughs> yeah, this is something that you can detail as little as describing the wall that the players see as they enter the city, you know? Yeah. And it can be something more important. Perhaps the players are in that city, and the city is being attacked, and they go to help out. Like, what, ex what infrastructure exists there to defend the city? Yeah. Um, here, let me, let me move this one up here, this, cause this is relevant. Um, if your, this settlement, it, like, is attacked, what's the typical defensive procedure? Are there warning bells? Are there town criers? What is the, how does this, how do the soldiers, how do the militia act? What does the government do? How does the, does the leader ride out on his horse with his militia? Does he lock himself in his room so he doesn't get assassinated? Um... How, how, what's the typical defensive procedure of a settlement? Once again, right. so guard, go ahead. This go. might not sound really important, sounds really minor, but I'm just saying that as a player, it would be so interesting and so immersive to have this attack on the city be proclaimed by, you know, this harrowing sound of a bell ringing and people, like town criers running up the streets and this and that, it can be really atmospheric. I'm just, I, I'm just saying that it's cool. Yeah. And once again, this is not something you totally have to figure out unless this place is probably going to be attacked. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's not super relevant. However, you never know if your players are just going to suddenly attack a settlement, you know? <laughs> so just in case your party of four human, you know, people, not humans per se, a party of four people suddenly attacks a whole city by themselves, all of a sudden, you gotta make it realistic with the defensive procedure, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this can all be detailed in just a couple sentences. Say, yeah. oh, okay, we have this many guards, we have a wall, we have this, these are the battlements, and here is, like, how fast they can react, here's how they, like, react, they have, like, you know, watchtowers, they have, you know, scouts and this and that. Yeah. Another thing to keep in mind when it comes to defense of just a location uh, is, like, its geographical placement. So, if mm. it's on a hill, and, like, they can see everything around them for miles. So, it'll be easy to see if an army is approaching or whatever. If they yes. are built into the side of a mountain, only the side facing not the mountain, but whatever is on the other side, a field or whatever is the only side of their city that they need to build defenses on. Yes. And as with a lot of these things, might not seem like really important, might not be important for the story, but you can make it important. It, there's this common like trope of like a fantasy of city, like the walls have never been breached, you know? Yeah. Invaders have never got in. And you can like take that idea of like, like defenses might, might not matter to this city or that city a bunch. But you can make a city and make their defenses a really important part of that identity. Yeah. Um, another thing to think about defenses is things like you might not conventionally think about when it comes to defenses, like walls or catapults. But like in Critical Role, it, one of the cities uh, in Exandria, Matthew Mercer's world, um, it's also like never been taken down or whatever. Um, but one of their defenses is not actually having any teleportation circles in the city. Um, mm -hmm. so that no one can teleport into the city. We talked kind of about this in the last settlement episode with transportation, I believe. Um, but that's like a, that's a way of, that's a defensive, uh, you know, maneuver to, 
remove all teleportation circles. Yes, um, and perhaps there's, you know, um, like strict pat-downs and searches upon entering a city yeah. or exiting a city. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps, like, the military enforces that really strictly, and that de- ties into the defenses. Yeah, okay, all tied into this, what we've talked about is, like, does your Solomon have a militia? Is it, you know, paid by the government? Is it volunteer? How does it work? Why do they need a militia? Do they need it for defending? Or do they use a militia to attack other people? Um, it is it or sort of thing where it's like, oh, we're the militia, but only if we're called upon yeah. to fulfill our duty. Is it mandatory? Each, you know, man or woman of this age or higher has to spend this many years doing this. Yeah. Um, and if they do have a militia, does the government, like, ever employ it on, the, on its own citizens? Um, does yeah. it do that to keep order, to enforce government rule? That's all this, that's so much juicy story stuff right there, right? If you have to deal with corruption in the government, or help the mil- militia, um, quell riots or whatever in the city, like, that's all, that's all stuff you can, uh, make stories out of. Um, yeah. you know? Like, right off a cool story be that settlement that we were talking about that taxes the people by demanding children, you know? Yeah. And perhaps sometimes they use the children they gather to form an army and they use it to enforce the tyranny upon the people. And right, that right there is a juicy story. Yeah, because then you're like, can you redeem all the kids who have been brainwashed and make them no longer serve the evil government? Um, anyway, yeah, so that's that's something to, to think about. Um, another question, how protected and safe are the settlement citizens? And what about the the rulers, right? So this all ties into military and to defenses. You know, how safe are they? When they're out farming, is there a wall surrounding their farming area? Are there guards watching around? You know what I mean? Um, and then also, like, your higher-ups. Is yeah. Are the rulers better defended? Um, the classic example is, like, a city with rings. And, like, you know... There's, like, layers that go closer and closer to the center like, and the like, walls. Like Shrek. Like uh, ogres. Like onions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because ogres have layers. Um, but, like, if your city is has, like, rings, like walls. and like the a outer cake. Yes. And, like, the outer <laughs> one has... Um, the outer layer has all, like, the farmers and the peasants. And then you get richer and richer the inner you go, right? That means that... You're less protected on the outside, and if you're more well off, if you're a noble or or a ruler or whatever, and you're on the inside, you're more, you're better protected, right? Yeah, and in, on a smaller scale, like, does each noble have a bodyguard or a garrison that yeah. they can call upon to protect them that they employ or is granted to them by the government or whatever? Yeah, this and is then, important because players be like, hmm. We should kill this guy sometimes, you know? It, it, just, it just happens. Sometimes, yeah, it's, yeah they have to, they they have they to just kill, kill someone. Um, but then, like, also just, like, you know, maybe people, nobles can have private defenses. Are there, like, public defenses, like a policing force to protect the regular citizens who can't afford a personal garrison or whatever? You know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, as well, all very important questions. You can make a whole campaign out of, like, the players being employed as the private bodyguard force for a certain noble. Yeah. And then that leads them on adventures and leads them to certain things, you know? Alternatively, they're employed as assassins of a certain yes. noble. Um, on the other side of the coin. And speaking of assassins... Oh, is that, is that, is that my cue? That was your cue. <sighs> Uh, I missed it. Sorry. One, one more time. Give it a go. Give it a go. <clears throat> and speaking of assassins... Oh boy, do I love assassins! You read the next... You read the next question. No. Yeah. yeah. Oh boy, do I love assassins! This year's settlement employee assassins <laughs> banned some mercenaries to deal with their arrivals? <laughs> that was good. That was, that was much better. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for example... If your village is a little village and they can't afford to use their own citizens as a militia or whatever, maybe they hire mercenaries. Mm-hmm. Which, hey, guess what? Most parties, adventuring parties, 
are like mercenaries. That is very true. It happens pretty much all the time. All right, go back, going back to the example of the farming village. Perhaps that their farms become endangered by some sort of creature that starts you know, roaming the lands around them. And they can't defend it themselves, and they need their farms to sustain themselves and to live. So they hire outside mercenaries to deal with it. Enter in the players. Boom. Wow, look at that. Um, but also, beyond that, do they hire other forces to help them further their goals? Do they hire assassins to anonymously deal with other lords without it being directly tied to that, you know, sit, that settlement's militia or whatever? Do they hire mm -hmm. bandits to go rough up the people who are traveling into that village so that village stops having tra uh, traders and travelers come through and so it hurts them? Like, are they employing devious little tactics like hiring other people to cause trouble but like it well, isn't like tied to them right like and that's like super interesting and such sorry and like espionage yeah exactly and that's that's a story right there right like dude there's these bandits like harassing our people who come into our city can you deal with them sure the player the party goes and deals with them but it turns out you know the twist is like oh dude these bandits are not just regular bandits they were sent by someone they were, sent, yeah, they were by, sent by someone to interfere with that little farming village of yeah. the Sturgeon Surgeon. The and, players and, went to help out because they were interfering yeah. and harming their farms, and they found out that those bands, bandits were sent by someone, sent by another settlement, because that other settlement wanted to win the blue ribbon at the farmer fair that year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, but Bada most bing, likely that's a the... campaign you can take and <laughs> take your players from first to twentieth level right there. Super serious, really dark, really <laughs> gritty campaign. Um, Enjoy. No, obviously, uh, the best assumption is always the bandits were sent by Surgeon Town. Um, <laughs> Surgeon Town, <sighs> those pesky surgeons. Um, I have nothing against surgeons, actually. Bless surgeons um, or sturgeons. Or Sturgeon. I love Sturgeon. You know what? I Nothing against the Surgeons or Sturgeons. They're, they're amazing. Um, uh, yeah, but no, but these are all, like, very important uh, things you have to think about. Um, and just, just like, in, your, in the bigger scope of your world as well, like, you know, why doesn't this person just invade that person? <laughs> like, that's a plot hole. <laughs> if you don't have, like, treaties or whatever or set up or, like, a reason, like, this village is well defended, like, why have they not just, like, taken it over, you know? Yeah, because want... here's the thing. Yeah. With people, people are greedy. Yeah. So what's stopping them from using a military to conquer or take over another area? Yeah. So these are things you just you just have to think about to, to make your world more realized, make it more authentic, uh, make it cooler. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, catapults and assassins and stuff are cool. Everybody knows yeah. that. So and there's even more that you can go into here with military. We just briefly touched the surface here. You yeah. can go into, okay, the hierarchy. Um, you know, certain you know regiments for this reason, for that reason, that are specializing in this type of attack or this skill. There's so much you can go into with military if you choose yeah, to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think we kind of talked about more like smaller scale settlements, but obviously like in cities, they probably have a full like, military army, not just, like, a militia or whatever. Like, they probably have, like, a mm -hmm. full army. Um, AC-130s and, like, Predator yeah. drones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Score streaks of all kinds, probably, in that army. <laughs> <laughs> UAVs. Yeah, so, like, when your players attack that settlement, do they call in a care package? <laughs> These are the things you need to think of. Yeah. Do they send the hunter-killer drones? You... It's just really important things. Can the you players need. buy a UAV? Yeah. Buy how? Mm. I don't know. From just killing people, they somehow get the ability to, to buy a UAV <laughs> from just killing people. Uh, uh. Anywho. Yeah, guys, we're cool. We play Call of Duty. <laughs> Look at us. <clears throat> I'm not friends with them. 
anyway, yeah, but all, all this stuff that we've talked about is very important. Trade, commerce. Uh, I think I think that the main important things, most important of all the things we've talked about that you want to figure out for your settlements, exports and imports. Very important. Um, very exportant. Uh, defenses. Very important. How is this settlement defended? Uh, and that's about it. Those are like the two most very very important things that we talked about today. That like every single settlement you need to figure this out for. Um, but if you want to go deeper into taxes and militias and the currency, you totally can. And you can come up with some really, really cool stories and stuff out of it. I mean, you can come up with a whole adventure literally based on someone f like you know, minting their own money illegally and making counterfeit money. That's a D and D adventure, you know. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you can make a whole adventure about taxes. No, but you literally could, Think as you about said. That. The question is, should you? But that's a question for another day. <laughs> the question we're asking today is the number one world building question. Dude, your segues are. Amazing. They get better every episode, I feel like. <laughs> Thank you. I, I practice at night. Yeah. I, ask, I segue my dreams and thoughts at night before falling asleep. <laughs> imagine. Imagine. Okay, so here's my challenge to you, Gabe. The next few conversations you're in, you if, if the topic ever changes, you always have to segue it, okay? <laughs> you have to find a segue. And if you want to go more intense... Your thoughts. In your brain, mm -hmm. you have to always segue your thinking. Okay? Because you know mm -hmm. how, like, when you're thinking about one thing, and then all of a sudden you're like, why am I thinking about this totally other thing? Yeah. You gotta, or I can be like, ooh, that was a big jump in the conversation. Speaking of jumps, have you thought about this poisonous <laughs> frog down in Africa? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay, what's the number one world building question? Everyone's on the edge of their seats. Because we went off on this tangent. <laughs> Alright. If you've been following along, you already know what it is. It is, how does this affect the other aspects of my world? When I change or add this aspect of commerce, of trade, of business, of military, how does it affect the world around it? Yeah. Does adding that militia cause tension in the nearby settlements? Does adding that export change the economic standing of that settlement? Yep. Ask yourself the deep questions. The deep questions. You won't. Um, no, we say this at the end of every episode um, because y this needs you need you need to know this. This needs to be hammered into your psyche chiseled and branded on the surface of your brain um you need to understand this question and you need to apply it to your world building okay um that's why we keep repeating it because it's the number one world building question it's just really important if you don't ask it's yourself the this most question, important thing to ask yourself when building a world yeah well, every time you ask me every time you change something if you don't ask ask this question to yourself um, and you don't have to go with it to like every single subtle ripple effect of your thing. You just have to think about this and make sure things are still authentic and realistic and make sense. Because if you don't, yeah. eventually your world becomes inconsistent and lame. <laughs> Do you want your world to be lame? No, you don't. That's On a more serious it. note. Nothing pulls someone out of the world yeah. than when they realize something just doesn't make sense to them. When they're yeah. questioning whether this thing makes sense and it brings them out of the world, then you're failing. That's a really harsh way to put it. Um, <laughs> it's true. You failure. You need them. Just kidding. <laughs> when you're breaking the internal logic of your world, yeah. then you're probably not fulfilling your goal of telling a story. Yeah, then you suck. No, I'm kidding. It just... You just have to figure it out enough so people are still immersed. You know? Yes. Um, once again, you have to follow every single little ripple um, in the most subtle ways because uh, you're going to just spend so long on your world mm -hmm. with very much things that ultimately don't matter. not because of the wind. 
This yeah. leaf fell because an assassin passed through here in the night. <laughs> and if the player succeeds on a DC 25 investigation check, they can find out. Find out what? Did you succeed on that check? I don't think so. You don't get to know. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, no, but that in all seriousness, you, you do, you know... Je- you just you just need enough so it makes sense <laughs> you know <laughs> um because think about it worlds that you've seen or been in or experienced in from a movie or a, a D campaign whatever it is you i know that you can think of times when you were thrown out of you were thrown out of the immersion you were like wait but why don't you just blank why can't just blank happen yeah um, because the creator of the world broke the internal logic uh, of what they had created. And I know that's rough, and there's a lot, a lot to think about, and that's a lot of work, but you're making a world, so, you know? It's kind of, it's kind of intense. <laughs> oh, hey, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Um, hey, uh, Check out our Instagram at d20 underscore academy and DM us or comment or something and we'll get you into our Discord, which is super groovy. Right, Gabe? There is poppin' and lockin'. And polka dotin'. And we got our YouTube mm-hmm. if you'd rather listen to episodes on YouTube and stuff like that. And hey, Gabe, what's next week's episode? Next week's episode is on Dungeons. Specifically, a format built for creating interesting and unique dungeons countless times it's called the five room dungeon you may have heard of it hey you want to hear our opinion you want to hear us talk about it maybe you haven't heard of it before what's that we're gonna talk about it. we didn't create it by the way it's in the, it's a thing that anyway we're gonna talk about it and look at it and <laughs> review it next week the five room dungeon gonna be a good time hey gabe what's the next world building episode gonna be about in like a month um magic magic and it'll be here before you know it like yep. magic. Yeah. Good job. <laughs>